there can now be no reasonable, science-based, doubt about the reality of global climate change effects brought on by the cumulative and rapidly growing emission of so-called greenhouse gases, primarily carbon dioxide, into the atmosphere. As these effects become increasingly more obvious worldwide, so commercial interests, groups of concerned individuals and national governments have been gripped by amounts of mass panic and what to do about it, to many. Paul Ehrlich's Malthusian population bomb of 1968 appears about to explode in the world's face in an indirect version of his millenarian vision of population growth, which outpaces agricultural production capacity, with predictably catastrophic results, for humanity. And his three-part crisis scenario does indeed seem now to be present, a rapid rate of change, a limit of some sort, and delays in perceiving that limit, Ehrlich's work was roundly criticized at the time, and later from many quarters, and much of what he predicted did not come about, nevertheless. Can the world afford to take the risk that the climate scientists have got it wrong? Is it not in everyone's interest to apply the precautionary principle in attempting to avoid the worst of their predictions now, rather than at some future time? As the chairman of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, Mr. Regender Puchori, has recently pointed out, Eleven of the warmest years since instrumental records began have occurred in the past 12 years, while major precipitation changes are taking place on a global scale. And I am the professor of children's literature at Newcastle University, and I want to write a very short introduction to children's literature, because although here in Britain one of the longest and most distinguished traditions of creating books for children, perhaps the longest and most distinguished in the world, we often take them for granted and we don't pay enough attention to what a remarkable cultural resource they are for adults and kind of cultural work they do for children and the way that they have served writers and illustrators as a cultural space for creativity subversion and opportunities to experiment with new ideas. So, what kind of cultural work the children's books do? Well, at the level of individual child, this is one of the places where children learn the vocabularies, get the vicarious experiences and see the images of the world that help them think about how the world works and where they fit into it, because children's books are first places that children encounter these things, they are often very direct, as a source of information about what a particular period thinks including what it thinks a child is, what a child needs to know, what childhood looks like, sometimes when we are looking at children's books from the past, it is very important to notice these kinds of children who aren't there, for instance, so that is one of the things that we have in children's books. W. Hi, Dr. Adams, you wanted to see me? M. Hi, Sarah, yes, I just wanted to talk to you about your zoology report. I'm making appointments with everyone to talk about their papers, W, O, OK, M, so what are you writing your report on now, W, I'm looking at bird migrations, M, O, great. That's such a great topic, are you focusing on anything specific, W, I think I've narrowed it down to birds that do short distance migrations, you know, geese and those birds, M, was there a reason you chose that particular topic, W, actually. A big part of the decision just came from the fact that I found the most information on short-distance migration, oh, and I found a lot of information on geese, m, okay, well, that's a pretty good reason to go with that, so what direction are you taking this report in, w, well, I thought I'd talk about goose migration in general, I found out that all geese have the same general migration pattern, so I'm going to discuss that first, then I'm going to talk about the patterns of specific geese, like, I thought I'd compare a few different species. Like the Canadian goose versus the Hawaiian goose, M, that sounds good, I'm looking forward to reading your paper. Alright, class, yesterday, 
I told you that we were going to start looking at a field of psychology called developmental psychology, this branch of psychology looks at the many ways people's minds and bodies develop from before they're even born until they die, so. We should just start at the beginning, I think, let's start with infants, so, when a baby is born up until he or she starts talking, the baby is referred to as an infant, infants can't do a lot of things that older children can do, let's look at the physical side of things. Babies are born with really poor vision, actually, they're legally blind when born, infants can mostly make out large shapes and stuff, but they can't tell detail, also, their sense of color isn't very good, for a long time, psychologists thought infants were colorblind right after birth. As it turns out, research has shown that most babies can, in fact, make out bright colors, for example, an infant can tell the difference between a bright red ball and a bright blue ball. But it would be much harder for an infant to tell the difference between a light blue ball and a dark blue ball, anyway, as infants get older, their sense of sight improves, some psychologists think that by the age of six months, an infant's vision will be almost the same as an adult's. M, we're going to spend the rest of the month writing different kinds of essays, first though, we need to talk about what makes an essay good, there are certain things that every essay, despite what you'll be writing about, needs to have, okay, so who can tell me one thing that an essay must have? W, um, doesn't every essay need an introduction, M, of course, every essay must have an introduction, in the intro, you'll talk about the focus of your essay, you might also talk about some of your arguments or subtopics, but if you do, you have to make sure that you're very brief about them. Your introduction shouldn't be more than a paragraph, so, what else does an essay need to have, W, a conclusion, M, absolutely. If you're introducing your topic at the beginning, you must conclude your argument at the end, the conclusion talks about similar things as the introduction. But it's not exactly the same, here, you have to wrap up your topic, you have to make sure that the reader is convinced that your point of view is right, yes, do you have a question, W, so, what happens in the middle? M, the middle's the most important part. That's where you tell your reader all the reasons that he or she should agree with you, that's where you really get to show off what you know. Both music and language have a lot of similarities, they involve complex sequences that unfold in time, and they are both forms of communication, this has interested many philosophers over the years, from Plato to modern-day scientists. Darwin even wrote about possible evolutionary links between music and language in his book The Descent of Man, and Leonard Bernstein gave a series of lectures at Harvard in the 70s on the grammar of language and music drawing from Noam Chomsky's theories, there are some basic, obvious similarities between the two, for example, both music and language have a rhythmic, systematic pattern of timing, accent, and grouping, both language and music have melody, structured patterns of pitch over time. Both have syntax, discrete elements like words or notes and principles for combining those elements into sequences, sentences are just random sequences of words and music has its own sequence of notes, both language and music also convey effect, meaning emotion using sound. You can make out a lot of emotion from a person's voice, and music has the characteristic of providing emotions like happiness or sadness. How people can recognize human faces, this is a hard but brilliant question, people should appreciate something, people can get visual information from faces and put a name on it, we can tell one's identity, age, work, health condition, politics, and friends, recognizing faces is amazing, difficult, and a clever thing, in conclusion, people can get a lot out of faces.
Talent is premium, and there is a war for talents in the 1990s because of the talent shortage, companies and countries are recruiting young talented people from different countries and sending young people to universities, some young people immigrate after they graduated from the university. They compete with the local students, countries and organizations should put talents at the primary positions. The collapse of loyalty makes employees happy to change their workplace because of the higher income. There are three reasons. First, the change of the nature of the economy leads to an increase in the talent's demand and need skills. Second, the shrinking labor force after the baby boom causes less supply of skilled workers, and the retirement of baby boomers will cause a shortage of experienced workers. Third, there is also a mismatch between what schools are producing and what companies need. Laughter is one of the greatest therapies in combating adversity, and whole communities and nations have frequently relied on humor to get them through their bleakest times. On August 13, 1961, the barbed wire was rolled out of Berlin to create the Berlin Wall, for nearly 30 years. Until it was dismantled, wall jokes proliferated especially among those living in the East, laughing was all that was left. Jokes about those who rule you and sometimes those who tyrannize you are a form of folklore that has existed in societies as seemingly different as communist Eastern Europe, Tsarist Russia, modern Egypt, 12th century Persia, and modern-day Iran. Humor can also be wonderfully subversive. It can protect self-respect and identity. Now, the study of biology is responsible for some of the most profound insights that humans have about the world around them. So, take a look at these four panoramas. In the upper left, you see some bacteria. This happens to be equal in line. You obviously see a butterfly, a flower, a dolphin. If you see that at the outer space, just looks these different forms and structures, you have no idea that they were all related to one another. So, one of the most profound things that biology told us is that all life on Earth is exceptionally related, similar to one another. So, for example, all of these life forms rely on DNA and RNA for storing and transmitting in using their genetic and inherited information. They are all based on cell. Cell is the fundamental building blocks of all life. All of these organisms consist of cells. And the cells essentially have the same chemicals inside of them, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, and the whole bunch of other stuff and much smaller amount. All these organisms conducted metabolism, in other words, chemical reactions that using convert energy from one form to another. And the basic chemistry is all very similar to one another. The war for talent refers to an increasingly competitive landscape for recruiting and retaining talented employees. In the book, Michaels, et al., describe not a set of superior human resources processes, but a mindset that emphasizes the importance of talent to the success of organizations. The war for talent is intensified by demographic shifts, primarily in the United States and Europe. This is characterized by increasing demand along with decreasing supply, demographically. There are simply fewer post-baby boom workers to replace the baby boom retirement in the U.S. and Europe, though this is not the case in most of East Asia, Southeast Asia, Central Asia, Central America, South America, or the Middle East, Eastern Europe also tends to have similar demographics, namely an aging and or shrinking labor force. While talent is vague or ill-defined, the underlying assumption is that for knowledge-intensive industries, the knowledge worker, a term coined by Peter Drucker, is the key competitive resource, see the resource-based view of the firm. Knowledge-based theories of organizations consistently place knowledge workers as a primary, competitive resource. Talent is never explicitly defined in the book, though the preface notes. 
A certain part of talent eluded description, you simply know it when you see it. After several further caveats, the authors go on, we can say, however, that managerial talent is some combination of a sharp strategic mind, leadership ability, emotional maturity, communication skills. The ability to attract and inspire other talented people, entrepreneurial instincts, functional skills, and the ability to deliver results. The authors offer no outside support for this assertion. A 2006 article in The Economist, which mentions the book, notes that Companies do not even know how to define talent, let alone how to manage it. Some use it to mean people like Aldous Huxley's alphas in Brave New World, those at the top of the bell curve, others employ it as a synonym for the entire workforce. A definition so broad as to be meaningless. The war for talent is seen by various sources as becoming irrelevant during economic downturns, however, there have been highly visible talent poaching by solvent firms of others who have economic hardship. Today 150,000 farmers in India have committed suicide in areas where seed has been destroyed, where they have to buy these seed from Monsanto and buy it every year at very high cost, and that high-cost seed is getting them into debt and that debt is pushing them to suicide. What we've done is create community seed banks in places where we collect and save seeds, rescue them from disappearance, multiply them and then distribute them according to farmers' needs, and about 40 community seed banks have been created across the length and breadth of India. Places where these have been created famers are not in distress, because the biggest cost today is seeds and chemicals, these seed banks have now been a new place where we can respond to the new crisis of globalization. On the one hand and climate change on the other globalization has led to farmer suicides, we are able to take seeds to these suicide zones and distribute so that farmers can break out of that dependency. Draw food crops get out of debt we've been able to create community seed banks to deal with climate change whether it's extreme flooding, the new droughts, the cyclones, the hurricanes that lead to salinization. And today for us the work on seed has become the place from where we are responding to the worst tragedies and worst crises of that types. Do you know who Amory Lovins is? Nobody. Amory Lovins is an unusual character. He is something of polymath. Just say, he has varied, sort of, knowledge across a wide range of fields. He's not an academic. He actually has a consulting company, which he runs until recently out of his home in Colorado. He lives beside Snowmass in a house built into the side of a mountain that has no furnace. For about 30 years, he has been kind of iconic plastic oddball genius thinking of ways to save energy. Thinking of ways to solve problems using technology that already exist, and he has demonstrated several of them. He also offers he is something that he is such an oddball that people tend to think he is kind of crazy. Anyway, Elizabeth Colbert went to spend some time with Amory Levins, and so she has written this piece called Mr. Green. Globalization, what is globalization? I think that it takes on a few different definitions in one sense of the word, globalization means proliferation of transactions across country, so, one way of thinking about globalization is a way to describe an increase in international communications. More trade happening between countries and be less self-sufficient in providing goods and services to their people and more companies that have offices in multiple countries, which we call multinationals, so, the source of growth in travel and communication and corporate trade across borders. And this way of thinking about globalization is the continuation of thinking that has been around for a long time, such as when the Europeans went to the Orient to find spices, which was also an example of global trade and communication, another way to think of globalization though. 
is an economic system, it is a system in which countries become integrated in a way that never had been before. In this system, we see a global split in the process between consuming and producing goods. Some countries produce goods, some countries consume goods. And then these countries in different areas of the globe depend on each other in a kind of organic solidarity rather than having an economic system being just inside your country. The system is the way economy in your country functions, depends on economy of another country, and in fact, this way of thinking about globalization represents a new area of economic progress, the past industrialist economy has been a global issue. Before we consider international environmental law and climate change, we need to consider domestic legislation, as it is within the sovereign states that international law is put into practice. This reflects the environmentalists' maxim, think globally act locally. United Kingdom legislative control over the impacts of man's activity on the environment is not new. As long ago as the reign of Charles II the main concern was the production of smoke from the burning of sea coal. Almost all areas of trade and industry were subject to very detailed legislative controls at that time, although some were governed by self-regulation in the form of guilds, who regulated both supply and methods of production, however. The measures implemented were mostly ineffective because then, as now, the specifying of legal duties and standards without providing any appropriate enforcement merely indicated good intentions but were of little practical effect. The next stage was prompted by the Industrial Revolution with the urbanization of society and its profound effects on the environment. Local industrialists used the Adam Smith model to maximize their economic benefit. But this was to the detriment of the local environment with the operation of Gresham's Law, that is, the bad drives out the good, those industrialists who were concerned for either the health of their employees or the local environment faced higher costs than their competitors. The result was the need for increasingly comprehensive statutory controls on the discharge of pollutants into various receiving media. Last month I published alongside my annual report a subject report on the development of citizenship in schools. The report celebrates the success of some schools in implementing the citizenship curriculum, it praises those schools where there have been substantial developments in the subject, and which now go a long way towards fulfilling national curriculum requirements. In the report we are critical of schools which have not taken citizenship seriously, either through reluctance or lack of capacity to make appropriate provision in the curriculum. Citizenship is marginalized in the curriculum in one-fifth of schools it is less well established in the curriculum than other subjects, and less well taught, and some critics have seized on this as a reason for wanting to step back from supporting it, yet. The progress made to date by the more committed schools suggests that the reasons for introducing citizenship are both worthwhile and can be fulfilled, given the time and resources, indeed, those reasons are given added weight by national and global events of the past few months. While not claiming too much, citizenship can address core skills, attitudes, and values that young people need to consider as they come to terms with a changing world. What is globalization? Globalization can usefully be conceived as a process, or set of processes, which embodies a transformation in the spatial organization of social relations and transactions, generating transcontinental or interregional flows and networks of activity, interaction, and power. It is characterized by four types of change. First, it involves a stretching of social, political, and economic activities across political frontiers, regions, and continents. Second, it suggests the intensification, or the growing magnitude, of interconnectedness and flows of trade, investment, finance, migration, culture, etc. 
Third, the growing extensity and intensity of global interconnectedness can be linked to a speeding up of global interactions and processes, as the evolution of worldwide systems of transport and communication increases the velocity of the diffusion of ideas, goods, information, capital, and people. Fourth, the growing extensity. Intensity and velocity of global interactions can be associated with their deepening impact such that the effects of distant events can be highly significant elsewhere and even the most local developments may come to have enormous global consequences, in this sense. The boundaries between domestic matters and global affairs can become increasingly blurred, globalization has three definitions, there are more trade transactions communications, services, and multinational companies across the border. There are more travels and cooperation between different countries, a global and integrated economic system has been formed in the world, one country does not depend on itself only, but countries interact more with each other in terms of production and consumption. Within most developed countries, notions of pragmatism, notions of the fact that we have democracies, have succeeded in tempering the market economy, Indiana, the 19th century, 18th century, the Industrial Revolution had a very negative effect on people, particularly working classes all over the world. We see data where life expectancy was reduced, heights were reduced, we were looking at the medical record, we can see that actually, living standards, much among large fractions of population, actually went down, but eventually, we passed the legislation about working conditions, and eventually, we circumscribed some of the worst kinds of behavior, we eventually, in the 20th century, we put regulations that composed better environmental conditions, and so, some of the damage was reversed and that we have made the market economy work in ways that the benefits of the all is far more what we shared in the world a hundred years ago. <laughs> Citizenship education is an important subject in schools as compared to the past, however, only one-fifth of schools have such courses that provide student right skills and attitudes. In the past, people were reluctant to teach, it is important for students in this changing world. There are still problems in teaching this subject due to lack of commitment and lack of teachers to teach, criticism about the theory of citizenship education is ineffective. Unless schools themselves reflected democratic practices by giving children the opportunity to have a say over decision-making. It suggests that schools are fundamentally undemocratic institutions. And that such a setting cannot instill in children the commitment and belief in democratic values that is necessary for citizenship education to have a proper impact. Citizenship education is one critical element, and students will acquire knowledge of civics, including the principles of democracy and associated local, state, and Australian government structure and processes. In addition, Students will also learn to participate responsibly and cooperatively in community. Citizenship curriculum is very important for students. But it is neglected by many schools. There are only one-fifth schools introduced this class to campus and allocated less time than other subjects. Moreover, the professor pointed out if given enough time in citizenship curriculum, it will be beneficial to improve students' skills and install positive attitude towards the changing world and tackle the issues such as lack of leadership. Language death is not mainstream theater, it is not mainstream anything. Can you imagine Hollywood taking it on? It is so far outside the mindsets of most people that they have difficulty appreciating what the crisis is all about. Because they are not used to thinking more about language as an issue in itself, somehow, we need to change these mindsets. We need to get people thinking about language more explicitly, more intimately, more enthusiastically. Interest in language is certainly there. 
In the general population, most people are fascinated by such topics as where words come from, or what the origin of their town's name is. Or whether their baby's name means anything, they are certainly prepared to play Scrabble and a host of other language games ad infinitum, and language games are often found on radio and television, too, but a willingness to focus that interest on general issues. A preparedness to take on board the emotion and drama inherent in the situation of language endangerment is not something that happens much. VR is a computer technology that uses virtual reality headsets or multi-projected environments, sometimes in combination with physical environments or props, to generate realistic images, sounds, and other sensations that simulate a user's physical presence in a virtual or imaginary environment. All modern VR displays are based on technology developed for smartphones, including gyroscopes and motion sensors for tracking head, hand, and body positions, small HD screens for stereoscopic displays, and small, lightweight and fast processors. These components led to relative affordability for independent VR developers and lead to the 2012 Oculus Rift Kickstarter offering the first independently developed VR headset. So, we were founded just over 10 years ago, when I was in the Royal Academy, a museum in the center of London, with my three children, at the Aztec exhibition, I don't know if any of you saw it, I had an older child and two younger children, twins, strapped in a pushchair, and one of my children, three years old, shouted, and I've never denied he shouted, he shouted, monster, monster at this statue, which looked just like a monster, had snakes for hair, a big beak for a nose, and, I thought, this is fantastic I've got a three-year-old that's appreciating art, how good can it get, so. I bent down and I said, yes, it looks just like a monster, and, at that moment, a room warden came over, a gallery assistant came over and said we were being too noisy, and threw us out, wrong family, I was, at that time, a journalist with the Guardian newspaper. And two days later wrote a big piece in the Guardian about being thrown out of the Royal Academy. What was really interesting was, by the end of that day, we had had, at the paper, over 500 emails from other families saying, museums aren't working for us, let's try and make it work, so. That's what we did, in The Guardian, we set up a campaign, we called it the Kids in Museums campaign, but it didn't really exist, it was just a few pages, we ran loads of stories on it, I began touring the country talking about how to make your museum family friendly. We all know that there are some factors for species and animals to survive and reproduce, including environmental conditions, temperature, tolerance range, body size, weight, diets, seasonal and daily activity, behavior, and the altitude they live. Animals migrate to find a new habitat because the change of environment and only species that have the tolerance for the new environment could survive and reproduce. Human beings are the only organism that makes extensive use of technology to extend the limits of its natural tolerance range. Normally, however, spectacles are a part of an assemblage of items giving us an overall look, in fashion terms. They are classes of accessories, along with shoes, jewelry, handbags, or watches, but in healthcare terms, they are called a medical device and, in many languages, other than English. They are often described as a prosthesis, an artificial part of the body, part of you, making you who you are and choosing your spectacles is therefore your major decision, increasingly. People own two or more pairs for different occasions or times of the day and there is a phrase for this in the industry. It is called lifestyle dispensing, 
and it dates back to the 1950s, the idea is that you wear one type of spectacles in the workplace and quite other at leisure or on the beach. When this dog approaches some food, another dog's playful snarls are played back, the dog seems curious, but the sound doesn't stop it from taking the bone, here a dog hears the growls of a dog being approached by a stranger, but these don't deter it from grabbing the bone either. In another scenario, the sound of a dog protecting its food is played back, this time the dog backs off, these experiments suggest the dogs can distinguish between different types of growls. People forget to take their cards after taking the money from the ATM occasionally, this is the common reason, because they get the money and walk away, in the UK it becomes less common, because people take their cards before getting the money, in the past. People made error by forgetting to get their card after they got their money, UK has restructured the new ATM, you have to get your card before you get your cash, although you would forget to get your money. It is more catastrophic to lose your card because it can access to your bank account. I believe our borders should be open, but if that is not politically acceptable for now, Europe should at least open up a legal route for people from developing countries to come work here. Over time, hopefully, we can move to a position where borders are completely open. Persuading skeptics won't be easy, that's why I think the argument for free migration has to be made at several levels, in principled case, it increases freedom and reduces injustice, in humanitarian case, it helps people much poorer than ourselves, in economic case, it makes us richer. In pragmatic case, it is inevitable. So it is in everyone's interests to make the best of it, freedom of movement is not just a matter of human rights and international solidarity, it is in our self-interest, opening our borders may seem unrealistic, but so too, once. Did abolishing slavery or giving women the vote, campaigning for people's right to move freely is a noble cause for our time. The comics I show you with lots of people chatting around in a room is a form of description, we use different kinds of methods to describe a situation, sometimes we have to use visual description, particularly when we do not witness the scenario. I was born during the Second World War and my hometown is, for example, when I asked my mother about the war, I always ask her you have mentioned this or that when you talk to me when asked her about the shelter, I asked her what the shelter looks like and when did you go to the shelter. From her response I could get more visual evidence as I can to write my book. But in the face of this sense of disempowerment, there is surprisingly is no decline in involvement in organizations which seek to share wealth and opportunities protect one another's rights and work towards the common good, according to the United Nations. Civil society groups have grown 40-fold since the turn of last century, internationally, the non-profit sector is worth $1 trillion, and there are 700,000 such organizations in Australia alone, the UN recognizes 37,000 specifically civil society organizations across the globe and gave 3,500 accreditations to the 2002 World Summit on Sustainable Development, this profound movement towards harnessing voices and resources from outside the realm of governments and officialdom reflects a profound growth in NGOs' third sector, as some call it. As Robert Putnam discovered in the field of local government in Italy, the best predictor of governmental success was the strength and density of a region's civic associations.
Hello, it's Megan. This week I'm going to talk about the difference between translators and interpreters. It's a common misconception that translators and interpreters do the same thing. So, I'd just like to highlight a few similarities and differences between the two. Firstly, translation refers to written communication, whereas interpreting refers to verbal communication. So, for example, a translator will not attend a court hearing to verbally translate between the parties involved but will translate the written evidence used in the case. Secondly, both jobs require different skills. I translate to require the ability to write well and comprehensively into a target language. This means that they need to have an excellent command of their native language. For example, although I can speak French to a good standard, I cannot translate from English to French although I could translate from French to English, which means I'm only halfway there to being an international player. An interpreter needs to be able to speak both languages proficiently. Thirdly, the qualifications and experience required to become either a professional translator or interpreter do differ. Both roles acquire years of training, the resulting qualification, but what they can learn from the training will be completely different. So, just to be clear, translators will translate written texts and interpreters will translate a verbal communication. Well, the Voynich manuscript does have many different theories proposed for it. Some people think that it's a complete hoax. It's now been carbon dated from the 15th century. So, it's most likely if it is hopes to have been a 15th century hoax, which I personally don't believe. But some people think it's just gobbledygook. It's just an invention to make money. Somebody made it to fool people and make money. Other people think it's probably a code. In other words, someone encoded lots of secrets in it hoping that no one would find out, and if so, that's been very successful, because no one has corrected it so far, but, in my opinion, it is actually a genuine script, obviously, a human-devised script, but masking behind it a genuine human language, in a language, it seems to me to have more, if you like Near Eastern, maybe Caucasian-Asian aspects, to it rather than European, because of some of the words that I've decoded, so, I would imagine that once we've actually managed to decode the script, we'll find that the language underneath is a natural human language, probably from that part of the world. Ever try to get a baby to smile? It can seem close to impossible and then suddenly there it is. That elusive, seemingly joyous grin, well, it turns out those smiles aren't spontaneous they're strategic, researchers have found that when babies smile, it's for a reason. They want whoever they're interacting with typically a parent to smile back, and they time it just so, a smile here and a smile there, the researchers call it sophisticated timing, the study is in the journal PLOS 1. The researchers enlisted real mothers and infants and quantified their interactions which fell into four categories. 1. Babies wanted to maximize the amount of time smiling at their mothers. 2. They wanted to maximize the time the mother smiled at them. 3. They wanted to experience simultaneous smiling. And 4. No smiling at all. By studying when smiles happened and what the subsequent effect was. The investigators were able to figure out that for mothers the goal 70% of the time was to be smiling simultaneously while, for babies 80% of the time they just wanted their mother smiling at them. So, mothers want the interaction, while babies just want to be smiled at. So, your baby may not be able to feed itself, talk or even turn over yet, but when it comes to smiles, babies seem to know exactly what they're up to. Why the bumblebees pick some flowers over others, researchers have known for a while that flower's color can be a signal, color in shorthand that says to a bee, hey, I get some good quality nectar here, want to stop by for a visit. But new findings show that bees also use color to get clues about a flower's temperature, 
and according to a study from a British research team published in the journal Nature, some like it hot, bees use up a lot of energy just staying warm on some days, in fact. They can't even fly if they are too cold, so, if one flower is warmer than another, a bee can save some of its fuel by basking on that flower while it's doing its pollinating business, and it turns out that bumblebees consistently do choose warmer flowers over cooler ones. Even when the two flowers offer up the same quantity and quality of nectar, some plants seem to be evolutionarily adapted to be slightly warmer because the warmer ones get visited more by the chilly bees, when it comes to getting pollinated, apparently the heat is on, and that is the buzz. A depression in a child dates back as far as the 16th century when the first concept of children's depression was discovered. A research was taken at that time to find out what happened to children who suffer from depression. The study revealed that a dramatic increase in children's depression can increase the risk of life. For example, long term illness such as diabetes and heart disease are caused by depression. One of the studies shows children with depression behave differently and respond differently to medical treatment. This is why many specialists respond differently to medical treatment. This is why many specialists have tried bringing a cure, but no one found a perfect medicine. It is quite rare that children suffer from depression, but in the recent study, the number has dramatically increased. Nowadays no one doubt about children's depression. It has become a common sickness in a child. Children's depression is still a puzzle for scientists and specialists that needs to be resolved sooner than later. This is Hans Krebs, who in 1937 published a paper showing the sequence of chemical reactions by which energy is released in individual cells. It is called the Krebs cycle, which some of you may remember from your chemistry course in your high school. Krebs is a wonderful example to me of how a scientist who is determined can overcome all kinds of human obstacles. Krebs's father constantly discouraged him and told him that he had just mediocre intelligence whenever to anything important in his life, as a teenager. What Krebs remembers in his memoir, his father said to him you can't make a silk purse at a sow's ear, and later on, when Krebs studied with the great biochemist Otto Warburg, Warburg also told him the same thing. Not the same quote, but that he had only mediocre ability and would never be a great scientist, and we all hear about how important it is for parents to encourage their children, but sometimes the children will go on to do great things no matter what we say to them. This simulation shows what you might see, if you are orbiting a black hole, the light and position of background stars around the hole are distorted by its gravity, and they seem to spin around. On the right, the constellation Orion appears to approach the event horizon, the boundary from which nothing can escape, Orion stars look like they become separated and get spun around, once the hole has passed by Orion reappears on the left and looks normal again. Users can also experiment with different scenarios. This is what you might see if you were traveling towards a black hole with rocket engines slowing your descent. Another simulation mimics free fall into a hole. In the middle, the light of the entire universe appears to be concentrated in a bright ring. This is talk about visualizing life without fossil fuels, we have an addiction to fossil fuels and it's not sustainable, when I say we, I'm talking about the so-called developed world, the developed world gets 80 or 90% of all its energy from fossil fuels and living on fossil fuels for energy. In this way, it's not sustainable for three fairly obvious reasons, first, on the left, easily accessible fossil fuels are a finite resource and so some point that resource will be exploited and humanity will have to do something else, second, 
Setting fire to fossil fuels puts carbon dioxide upstairs. So, we have the climate motivation. The clear consensus of the climate science community is with substantial arrow bars still on exactly what might happen, their advice is. This is a geoengineering experiment that was well advised to stop as soon as possible. And third, even if you don't believe in climate change and even if global fossil fuels aren't running out, today it might be the case that your fossil fuels our fossil fuels in a particular country or state have run out and you might depend on other countries or states for fossil fuels in the future, so, you have a security of supply motivation for saying let's look into really getting off fossil fuels in a serious way. I find all three of these motivations are equally compelling and I'm just going to take it as given now that we are interested in discussing life after fossil fuels. They call it the marshmallow test, a four- to six-year-old child sits alone in a room at a table facing a marshmallow on a plate, the child is told, if you don't eat this treat for 15 minutes you can have both it and a second one. Kids on average wait for five or six minutes before eating the marshmallow, the longer a child can resist the treat has been correlated with higher general competency later in life. Now a study shows that ability to resist temptation isn't strictly innate at also highly influenced by environment. Researchers gave five-year-old used crayons and one sticker to decorate a sheet of paper. One group was promised a new set of art supplies for the project but then never received it, but the other group did receive new crayons and better stickers, then both groups were given the marshmallow test. The children who had been lied to waited for a mean time of three minutes before eating the marshmallow, the group that got their promised materials resisted an average of 12 minutes, thus, the researchers note that experience factors into a child's ability to delay gratification. When previous promises have been hollow, why believe the next one? Today a university like the LSE certainly has to acknowledge that it is in competition for the best students, all of whom have choices they can exercise, and many of them choices which run across national and continental borders, we are in competition, too, for staff. The academic job market is one of the most global 25 there is, and in the 21st century English is the new Latin, so universities in English-speaking countries are exposed to more intensive competition than those elsewhere we are in competition for government funding. Through the assessment of research quality, we are in competition for research contracts, from public and private sector sources, and indeed we are in competition for the philanthropic pound, many of our own donors were at more than one university. And indeed think of the LSE's requests alongside those of other charities to which they are committed, that is a competitive environment which is particularly visible to a vice-chancellor. Why does burning a food item provide information about its value as a food? The nutritional value of food can be measured on many different scales. The most basic measurement scale is the free energy content of the food. In other words, how much energy is released when chemical bonds within the food are broken? The energy content of food is measured in calories. The amount of kinetic energy required to raise the temperature of 1 ml of water, 1 degree, Food is burned under controlled conditions. Breaking chemical bonds and releasing free energy, the burning is chemically similar to the breakdown of food in cellular respiration although the process occurs much more quickly and in a less controlled fashion during ignition. Calorimeter can measure the energy in food, but cannot measure the digested energy of what we have. <laughs> 